Okay. Do I have any questions about MIPS data path single cycle stuff? Yes. Um, so I kind of don't fully understand the. What, can you get, can you scroll to the single cycle and pipeline the third derivation case equation? All right. Um, so I understand the pipeline one, but the single cycle one. Why is so? Why is um, the stages? Uh, okay. The question is why in this case why is the stages irrelevant? So what does the single cycle time represent? All right, so does all, not, not all of the computations. <laughs> one computation, but what specifically is part of that one computation? Each stage. Each stage, right? So TSC already accounts for all of the stages. Yeah, does that make sense? Does everybody ask, understand what he's asking? Yes, no, a lot of, okay, I'm getting a lot of no. All right, so in the pipeline, in this calculation here, right? So we figure it out, we derived K plus N minus one last lecture, right? Times the psych type, uh, pipeline time. So if you recall from this diagram, right? We figured out that the single cycle time is going to be the length of the longest instruction, right? Which means that, you know, in this case, you know, our format is not accessing the data memory, branch not accessing data memory or write back, store word doesn't access write back because we're not writing anything back to the registers, correct? So what happens is that the clock cycle is going to take the, the length of the longest instruction which means it already accounts for all of the cycles. In a pipeline, it's the, uh, the cycle is much shorter. Instead of eight sec nanoseconds, it's two. That's a terrible drawing. See how this works? So we have to account for the number of cycles, which is K. So that's why in this equation here, there's no K. Now, the thing is, is uh, when you actually reduce this, what this is actually, is limit as n approaches infinity. What's actually happening here is n's going to infinity there. This n's going to infinity here. So this becomes TSC over TP, right? And the single cycle time does account for K. So in an ideal, simple, linear pipeline, this is just k times t of p over t of p. Those cancel out, which is why we get k. So, that's an, so when I say ideal, simple pipeline, what that means is that you have some sort of ideal pipeline where all of the stages take the same amount of time, but that's not the way it works in the real world. Yes, Alex. Uh, that uh, definition of the Correct. Hmm? Any other questions? So you're all data path experts now. I was surprised that nobody has any data path related questions. All right. All right, so this is uh, what we were talking about yesterday is how the signal kind of goes through the data path. I'm going to go through this again, and we're going to start actually discussing uh, how these instructions take place, and we don't wor start to worry about things called hazards. So a pipeline version of data path with buffers. So this is kind of a reduced version of the data path here, and all the buffers so this is IFID, this is the buffer between instruction fetch and instruction decode, right? So in case you're, this is in your textbook, IFID. And so then you have IDEX, which is the uh, buffer between the stages of instruction decode and execute. So take the value from read, the read registers, no, not the right register, and then put them on the buffer. Also, we take that sign extended value and they put us on the buffer, 
And what ends up happening is these values wait until the start of the next clock cycle. And once it's on the next clock cycle, what ends up happening, let's see if I can, yep, what ends up happening here is that you get the value from the read registers, 5 to 32, you get the actual value, you put it on the buffer, same thing, same thing here. And then, let's do this in green, and then clock cycle happens, and then this value comes here to this multiplexer. What's the name of this uh, control signal? ALU source, very good. So then we have this decisions made here, that goes here. We have shift left two. This is calculating what? Branch, Branch address, very good. And so then it's put. They're all put on the next buffer there to wait to the data path signal. Here, if it's an R type instruction, what's going to happen is this is going to circumvent the data memory block, right, and then be put on that buffer. Same thing. But this is calculating the address. And if it's a store word, we'd write the data. We have mem read and mem write here. If it's a load word, we're going to read the data and put it on the buffer there. And then we're going to use our, what's this uh, control signal here? Mem to reg, very good. And then it goes back to the registers. So this is an important concept that we're about to discuss called write then read capability of the registers. What's happening here is I want, let's say this, uh, I, this is calculating S0, right? So I have some sort of, it's going to be uh, 0 here. Um, this figure is wrong. It's from the textbook. It should be 1 because it's coming out of the data memory. All right. Um, if it's coming out here, let's say this is S0, right? And then I have some sort of value where I've gotten the values from the registers and put them on the buffer, right? I want to basically write to the register first and then read it. And the reason why is because I want the most recent copy of the, of the value coming out of the register. So it's going to write and then read. Does that make sense uh, why that's important? So the way this works is you have the instruction fetch. You have your, this multiplexer is basically controlling your branch and your jump. You have your PC, your PC plus four, and that's those values are put on the buffer. Right? Pretty straightforward. Instruction decode, what ends up happening here is we're getting the values coming out here. We get, goes to the controller, 25 to 21, 20 to 16, 15 to 11. It's simple. If I have the multiplexer here, what's the name of that control signal? Someone besides, someone besides, yeah. Register, not source. Register destination. Why is it register destination, not register source? Right. So, very good. But you're on the right path. Just, you know, uh, this is ALU source over here. That's register destination. <coughs> That, and in case that's in case you're wondering, that's why I ask a lot because that's a that's a common exam mistake. So try to weed it out here. So what ends up happening is now we're reading from the registers. Now you see how the registers are broken up into a light, you know, white and blue half. So what's going on there is it's saying, hey, I'm going to read from the registers and put the value onto the buffer. Or the, or the I call them red, call them registers or the buffer. Yes, Alex. No, it does not. So your question is, how do we take care of that? Yes. Well, what you are alluding to is a concept called data forwarding. Or no, what, what the solution to that is a concept called data forwarding. So uh, what you are referring to is known as a data hazard. What ends up happening when, what, and what Mr. Gunter is talking about is, what happens when I write to this register <coughs> or I'm updating an S0 and putting it on the buffer, but a previous instruction already had this value and is pointing it towards the ALU. So this, this copy of S0 is not up to date because we've updated it here. Does that make sense? We're going to be going over that today. That's called a data hazard, and we're going to use something called data forwarding. Yes, Emily. Um, going back to what you asked Sal about why it was registered destination, mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, no, 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 no. Okay, so that's a different that's a different control signal entirely. Okay. So I have to make it. If you look to the left of your in your diagram in your notes, right? Yeah, this is an old one. Okay, that's that's old new. I hope it's correct. Um, to the left of your registers, you see probably see something like. Sorry for the scrolling. I know this annoys people when I do it on the. Uh, you know, so I have a control signal here to indicate whether or not I want to write to the register, and then I have to make a decision whether it's 20 to 16 in a type, case of an I type or 15 to 11 in case of an R type. That makes sense to everybody? I need another control signal to make that destination d difference to control the multiplexer. Okay. So I'm I was referring to register destination, not the register write control signal okay. when I was asking Sal that question, or when Sal answered the question. So the question I asked was, there's a control signal that goes here to make the decision on which right register I'm writing to. This and is a simple. Like you're asking yes. Like what should go right there? Yes. Okay, cool. yes. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Very, very good. Buffer is a is a register, and you it registers are either SRAMs or DRAM cells. So what ends up happening is we, a buffer is specifically a type of SRAM cell where it's going to hold the value. So they can always hold a previous value and then a next value, right? So what ends up happening is I'm holding the value, I'm holding the value, I'm holding the value. I put the clock signal, and then it writes. But what's actually physically doing when it writes is it's holding the value, holding the value, holding the value. The clock signal happens, and then it puts those values onto that bus. So it is inside of that Yes. Ooh. A register technically is anything that holds a value until you request it, either through a register write or a clock signal. So in this case, the registers here, and this is actually a really good question. So the registers there are 32-bit values that hold, you know, all, remember those 32 uh, registers from the MIP screen sheet? That's your save temporaries, your temporary registers, your argument variables, your return <laughs> variables, your global heap and stack pointers, and your OS kernel. Remember, remember all those? They're located here. Those will hold those values until a register write comes in, at which point the value that's written back with write data is used to update it. Does that make sense? These registers are values that, the, are you all are familiar with how sequential memory elements work, correct? Basically, a basic idea of SRAM. So you have right lines and dip. So basically you have two inverters that go in a loop like so. And then you have other, uh, you have other uh, NMOS cells. I don't want to go too much into what CMOS is, but you have like a word line and a bit line. And what's up happening is until you, until you write, what's actually happening is the value is physically going back and forth between these two inverters until you actually say I need to either rewrite it at which point I can get the value. So what's actually happening here in the register <coughs> is that it's looping like so, which is why I'm drawing in a circle, and then once the clock signal happens then it puts it onto the buffer, onto, onto, onto the bus here. Does that make sense to everybody? Very good. Any other questions? Which control takes it out of the buffer? The clock. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is what, what control signal takes it out of the buffer? In each buffer, these are run by clock signals. And then the other control signals like register write, register destination, ALU source, control multiplexers, or in this case, you have the ALU op controlling the from the function. So the values coming out of the controller are are doing specific functions to indicate how you want the flow the the uh, data to flow through the data path. In the case of the in the case of these buffers here, it's a clock signal that's saying until I have you know reached a positive rising or negative rising clock, which you all become very familiar with in 386 when you deal with Verilog. Um, it either happens on the positive edge or the negative edge, right? MIPS, I believe, is positive edge triggered, which means that once the clock goes from 0 to 1, 
it will actually put that signal on the bus until it receives that. So that way, the reason why you have to have either one or the other is because the clock signal is not com the clock signal goes from here to here, right? So the buffer has to differentiate, meaning that this is the start of the clock signal and this is the start of the next one. So it shouldn't do anything there. It shouldn't inadvertently put another value on the ALU because the ALU is a is not sequential. You know, it's comb combinational, which means it'll act it'll calculate anything you put on it. So you have to wait and wait and wait, right? Any other questions? So yes. So are these buffers put in a way to avoid the data hazards? Yes. Um, what? Well, the uh, we're going to be going over the different types of hazards, uh, so I don't want to go into too much to answer your question. But um, this specific one is known as a as a control hazard. Any other questions? Does it affect the speed? Yes. Yes. So uh, the, the reason why we did the problem that, uh, that Jacob was asking about at the beginning is to demonstrate that in an ideal world, we'd be able to get a, an improvement of K using pipelining, meaning that we break it into stages so we can have, you know, can do an instruction fetch here, we have instruction decode of the next instruction here, we're executing the other instruction here, <laughs> we're doing data and memory of a fourth instruction, and then we're writing back for a fifth instruction. So that's the ideal situation. So that's the whole goal. Now, what we're going to learn later is because of hazards that Caleb just alluded to, we're not going to achieve, achieve that ideal speed up. But we're still trying to you know, have a, uh, a high performance execution of compiled code, which is why we're doing the pipeline in the first place. Any other questions? This is a good sign. Yes, very good. Yes, that is something we will uh, cover in a little bit. Um, so this is the, uh, see the execution data path and write back and then, uh, let's see, let's see if I, if I can find the exact diagram. Yeah, here we go. So this is the way it works. So you have your controller, all the control signals are following along. And then what ends is in the execution stage, these all actually go to the execution portion of the data path, the memory and write back go to the buffer. And then here, the memory stage. You know, mem read, mem write go there, and the write back goes to that buffer. Which means that your register write signal is not going straight there because register write means you'd just be writing immediately. You want the register write to occur when the value you want written comes along as well, right? So you're going to have the ALU coming out here or the data memory and make that mem, uh, mem to reg decision. This you want that register write coming along with it as well. Oh. It actually worked out nice. Um, I learned a new trick today. Um, you want them coming together. You want the register write and the value you're writing to the register. <coughs> scroll past all of this as well. Any other questions? Okay, so. Memory stage of the data path, you're getting everything up. The ALU, it's been waiting here. It goes there. We're either uh, writing to it in the case of a store word, or in the case of a load word, you're getting it from the data memory, putting it on the buffer. And then the ALU circumvents the value here. Clear all, please. <coughs> and then in the write back stage, we're writing back to the registers with the decision from the memory to register uh, control signal. So. Here is how this is actually working. So this is a diagram you'll see in the textbook, and you can use this. Uh, um, there are simpler ways to do this. Uh, typically, uh, when students are doing this on the exam, you'll want to see you'll see MF uh, decode execute and write back, and they see MFD execute write back MFD execute and write. You see how this is working? You don't have to draw these registers. You don't have to draw the ALU every time. This is a a description of how what's what's actually going on. So in this case, we have a load word instruction where we're uh, dollar sign one. That's the same thing as the, this is correlating to the actual register number. 
we, have, we would prefer S0 than, uh, than trying to pull. In this case, it's pulling it from an argument. But in this case, we're doing an offset of 20, and then we're adding it and storing it in register 10, which is me just uh, it's register T2. So in this case, what's happening is we fetch the instruction and we put the load word on the instruction. This is instruction by time. So this is one data path, but this is demonstrating what's happening at any given moment. So at the second clock cycle, which is why it says CC2 up here, we are taking the value from the <coughs> registers and putting them on the, this buffer. At the same time, we're going, we're going to the instruction memory and we're putting the subtraction instruction on the buffer. Clock cycle three, the load word instruction is using the arithmetic logic unit to add the, the base pointer and the offset. The subtraction instruction is using registers to put them on this buffer here. Addition, we are getting that instruction and putting it on, on that buffer there. At the fourth clock cycle, the load word is, ob is now obtained the address of the pointer, it is getting the value from data memory and putting it on this buffer. At that same time, the arithmetic logic unit is being used to perform the subtraction of S2 minus S3. The dish instruction is getting 3 and 4 from the registers and putting them on this buffer here. In the instruction memory, we are getting the load word instruction. Does that make sense so far? At the fifth time, we are writing <coughs> the value to the register. So this is where write then read comes into play. And I'll explain that in a second. So data memory, it's white here because we're not putting anything to data memory. So it's just the result of two at uh, register two minus register three is being put on that buffer. Three register three plus register four is being calculated in ALU and being put on this buffer. This value of one is being taken out. We have our sign extended. 24 here, and that's being put on this buffer here, and then we are fetching the instruction from add. You see how that's all working, and then everything is kind of working out here? So uh, the question I have is, what kind of problems could arise from this? What are some issues that you could uh, see here? All right. So yes, you've, you've set a term. So someone tell, okay, so someone tell me precisely what you think, give me an example of an, a data hazard, structural hazard, control hazard, that you, what you think those actually mean and how that might come up in the data path before I formally define it next. Could there be an issue like in some of the stages are assuming the register in two different places? Yes, that's, that is definitely an issue. So what would happen this is a, a uh, this would be a big thing here. So what if instead of four, I was using eleven for this next instruction? So what ends up happening is uh, two and three. So I'm subtracting two and three, right? So the value that I want for register eleven is there at that buffer. It's not back at the register, correct? But what's happening is I'm getting the values of three and eleven and putting them here on this buffer in between the register and the ALU. So what ends up happening is I have the old value of 11 there and the new value of 11 here at the next buffer. See how that's a problem? That's known as a data <coughs> hazard. So struct, uh, structural hazard is something like this. Where we're trying to use the same structure within the data path for two different instructions. So this is where the write then read capability of MIPS becomes important. So in this case, let's say I had 10 here, right? And let's say I wanted to do, for some reason, 10 here, right? So what happens is I want to write the value of register 10 first and then read the value of register 10 from that. Because if I do it the other way around, I'm putting an old version of register 10 on this buffer and then writing. Is that the only, uh, in this 
hazard. Yes, structural hazard, yes. And why is that? In this version of MIPS, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. The other way we split up the, the, the reason, another reason why we're able to avoid a structural hazard is imagine if we only had one memory. Instead of instruction memory and data memory, we only had memory. What would, where would our structural hazards be? Instead of thinking of uh, data memory and instruction memory as separate, imagine they were together. What, would, what, would some, what were some issues that would be here? There's two instances on, on this one that I can see. Yep, here we go. So I'm trying to access data memory while simultaneously trying to access instruction memory. So I'd have to have something that would tell me whether or not it was an instruction or a value from data memory, right? So we're not going to go in, into multi-cycle data path in this class, but in the MIPS multi-cycle data path, they actually combine the memories into one, which causes more control signals, more issues, <laughs> harder data paths to learn, right? So that's why in the case of the Harvard architecture, they split it up, instruction memory and data memory, to specifically reduce what's known as a structural hazard. So we've covered data hazard and structural hazard. Um, and I know this will be the next TGOs, but what's the, I've been talking about this concept of control hazard. And while it's not specifically in this group of instructions, what do you think a control hazard might be? Okay, that's, that's true, but a control... All right, so let me give you a hint. Let's, let's say of sub, let's say this was branch equivalent. <coughs> let's say this was uh, 10, right? So what's the issue that's happening here? Very good. So basically what that means is I have now fetched an instruction... I've gotten the values out, and now the ALU is calculating this value, right? So there's no guarantee until I get my zero bit out whether or not I actually want to do these next instructions, right? Meanwhile, I'm already getting the instruction out, and it's or I'm already accessing the registers. So this is what's known as a control hazard. So let's start talking about those. You guys are very happy that you've avoided TGOs up to this point. So 5.17, define pipeline hazard and define the three types of structural hazards and give an example of each. We bet that would be a, an exam problem if I know it that well. Pipeline hazard is defined as a situation in which the next instruction cannot complete execution one clock cycle after the completion of the present instruction. So when you think about it, in the case of I have to wait for a value to come back, right? As we were talking about, uh, the one that Jacob was mentioning, where we have a value that is further on in the data path that we've uh, calculated with the ALU, and we are waiting for that value to come back. We can't complete the instruction one clock cycle afterwards, right? So we have to do something and we're going to call that inserting a stall. And we'll go over how that works in a bit. But basically, you can't complete the instruction one clock cycle after the completion of the present instruction. So the first type is data hazard, which we've all discussed, but it's formally defined as an instruction cannot be completed because the needed data to be generated by another instruction in the pipeline is not available. So here, what's being described is that I have the value 1, that's the result of re the addition of register 2 and register 3, correct? So the simple way would be a big fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back. Fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. 
fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. So what's going on here with all this blue that you might be wondering what's actually going on? I will not have the value of <coughs> written to the register until this write back signal here, correct? Let me choose the darker blue so you all can see in class. Correct? Does that make sense? If I might potentially need it in this execution stage here, and I might need potentially need it in this execution stage here as well. So if I had, you know, if I was using register one and register one in either of those next two signals, next two instructions, I wouldn't have the most recent copy until right back. So what ends up happening is that the data that has been generated by another instruction in the pipeline is not yet available to it because it hasn't been written to the registers yet. So let me ask you a question before uh, we go on to structural hazard. What could you do now that you all are aspiring engineers and you have a fundamental understanding of the advanced di uh, digital system, right? What can you do? What would you add to the data path to fix this problem? Nothing? <coughs> Everyone's just, everyone's just too insistent on copying down the structural hazard definition. If I were trying to fix a data hat, these, da these data hazards, what would I do? What could you do? Any ideas? You all, you all aspire to be engineers, not copy and copy stuff from other people. What other people have done, right? Yes. Um, if it's, if it's waiting for Okay, that's one way of doing it. You can stall it. You can stall it and wait. But what's the what's the uh, what's the goal of MIPS? Basic goal of MIPS: high performance execution of compiled code. So there's so we can, let's come up with another way. How else would I go about doing it? Could you, yeah. Could you arrange your code so that the things that need the values are Okay, so compiler optimization is another approach that's used. Um, so let's come up with a, an, another scenario. Let's say I, there's no way I can optimize this code. I have some sort of code that's written where I equals J plus K, and then the next line of code is L equals I plus Q or something like that, where I absolutely, the next instruction absolutely needs the I. But, you're, but that, is, that, that is a correct answer. Both of you have said correct answers. It's just not the one I'm fitting for. <coughs> No. We, have, we're, we have now have a theoretical where we cannot optimize the code. Think about it. Okay, so you're all still thinking, you're all still thinking like software engineers. Advanced digital system, hardware engineers. What else can you add? Think about how I phrase the question. What else can you add to the data path? There are ways you can streamline it as soon as you get it. Bingo. It's called data forward. So what's going to happen is I get the value out and I can actually have it come back. I can add a multiplexer to compare which one I want. If I know that this is the most up-to-date value because I actually have the forwarding control <laughs> signals, I will use this one instead of that one. That's exactly how it's done. That was that was the answer I was fishing for, but the, what you both said is correct. Yes, hi. So the buffer not work? Like, does it not go into a buffer at all? If it has to go back? Right? No, 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 no. Um, right, so there's your definition of structural hazard. What's actually happening is it'll circumvent them. It'll store it on a buffer, and then on the next stage, it'll actually bring it back. So they basically what's happening is it's bringing all these values back to a uh, multiplexer before the arithmetic logic unit, which we'll go into more detail in a little bit. But that's that's exactly it's, it is still holding it on the buffer. So in this case of a structural hazard, I discuss why we. Uh, <coughs> If we didn't separate instruction memory and data memory, then this instruction here, we have an instance where we are simultaneously trying to store memory and obtain value from a load memory. Uh, requires instruction, fetch, memory read, and memory write. So we're writing 
to data memory here in the store word instruction and I'm still trying to access memory. Does that make sense? Any, in the simple way you can do it is you can, uh, you can even go, it has to be four before, right? So you can just go load word 10 comma 20 dollar sign one, two, three, and then store word, right? 13, 24, and then one. So what's going on here is because I'm obtaining the store word instruction while simultaneously getting value from data memory, the result is that I'm simultaneously trying to read from memory an instruction and read from memory a value. So if we didn't split up the instruction and data memory, we would have a structural hazard, which is why that data path is designed the way it is. I'm going to scroll up here. So control hazard. So that last part, instruction fetched is not known. So while I have, while this is a, uh, a little bit bigger than what you'd require, anything where branch equivalent is being done, right? So I have branch equivalent. So I have 28 there, so that value is, I'm trying to branch seven instructions, right? So what happens is I have branch equivalent, I am comparing one and three, and I am trying to figure out <laughs> Uh, whether or not I want to branch 28 or 7 instructions. So what's actually going on here is that I don't know whether or not I want to do this AND instruction. Right? So you can just write those two. That's sufficient for a uh, full credit answer. Why is that sufficient for a full credit answer? Because you don't know whether or not you're going to do the next instruction until the branch equivalent takes place. So you could write five other instructions and waste your time, or you can just write the two instructions. <coughs> right? Instruction to be fetched is not known, and then this is sufficient. Okay. So does anybody else, does anybody, I'm sorry, does anybody have any questions about data hazards, structural hazards, or control hazards? So are, is the pipeline hazard, are these... The pipeline, pipeline hazard is... All, all the there the pipeline hazard is all three of these types of instructions. So the reason I phrase the question this way is what is a pipeline hazard? Okay, I can't guarantee the next instruction is going to be completed one sock clock cycle after the previous one. Why? Well, in one case I might have a data hazard where I'm waiting on a previous instruction. Uh, and I and I know I've answered your question, but I'm explaining it to try to reinforce how I want to answer the question. And here's an example of a, of a data hazard. Next one is a structural hazard. What happens if I don't split up instruction memory or data memory? Then I get this weird thing where if I'm trying to do load word and store word, if I'm trying to, you can either do load word or store word or store word and load word. That's perfect. Um, and then leave the three instructions between a blank, or you just go. Just indicate with a dash that you know that there's, they have to be five apart, right? And then control hazard. What happens if I'm trying to do a branch? Branch not equal. I can't, I don't know if I'm going to do the next instruction or not. So those are the three types of instances where I can't guarantee that I can do the next instruction. Other questions? Pipeline hazard is the, is all three. The pipeline hazard is a data, uh, yes, square or rhombus, rhombus is square. Um, but a data hazard, structural hazards, and control hazards are three types of pipeline hazards. Because these don't happen in single cycle, right? If you just complete the instruction and then do the next one, you don't have to worry about forwarding anything around. Yes? Is there a way to shift the pipeline where you don't get a Yes, we'll be discussing that in, in a bit. Basically, what you've referred to as inserting a stall. Any other questions? All right. I like this. You guys are asking the right kind of questions.
Pipeline stall, that's the definition. So control unit or compiler inserts delay. So Patrick, as if on cue, right? Or what are known as no op cycles, no operation between instructions in order to prevent pipeline hazards. So yes. Did I? 18. Data forwarding. The other thing we've been alluding to. So the two ways you can really get around these, other than splitting up the instruction memory and data memory, is data forwarding. Output of a resource used by instruction is forwarded <laughs> to the input of a resource being used by another instruction. So in this case, you're either getting the value from the output of the ALU to the, in, to the input of the ALU, right? So I'm calculating the next one. Or in the instance if I have two before, I'm doing it from the uh, buffer from in between uh, data memory and write back, correct? So you make those choices. And then you can forward that value back so that way you don't have to wait for the register to write. Or when it's right back, instead of waiting for the register to write and then putting on there, it can also just be forwarded straight from there as well. So the control signals is a two bit control signal 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1, which we'll go over in a bit. And the other one is a pipeline stall, which is what Patrick was just uh, alluding to. Control unit or compiler. I think it was, uh, it was either William or Sam who said, Sam said, you said compiler, right? So that's what you were saying. Compiler, optimization, and control unit, which is what William was saying. So you guys were basically coming together to define pipeline stall. C control unit or compiler inserts delays or no operational cycles between instructions in order to prevent hazards or prevent pipeline hazards. By the way, if that's a good sign. That means you all are starting to think like engineers. That makes me happy. We can give you this degree after all. And this is ultimately why you're writing down. This is why I broke the, uh, um, the TGOs and the, and the data path down into stages. Because <coughs> the way I had to learn it when I was an undergraduate, <coughs> it was through the single cycle pipeline up there. And everybody went, oh my god, what's that monstrosity? And they're like, OK, now we have to break it down into stages. How do you do that? And I went, oh. So uh, needless to say, uh, the exam did not go very well. Um, and then I was a TA the first time, and uh, that exam went really poorly. Um, in fact, one guy just gave up and just drew a giant pigeon. <laughs> and so I, I let's call that the pigeon myth. So I just said, I think there's a better way to teach this so students will understand a lot better. So I broke it down into stages. That's worked a lot better. That ends up making the pipelining work a lot better, too. So I get a lot of questions. Or, or when I ask these questions and I get the answers like, uh, like William and Samuel were given, and uh, and Sal and Jacob and everybody else and, and Caleb, who all, who's been saying these different portions of it. You all realize that you've been putting together portions of the what becomes the data forwarding and uh, pipelining stalls. How do you actually make it run faster at the physical level? So now you're understanding that you're demonstrating that you understand a advanced digital system. You guys can earn your grade. So. All right, so here's how this is going to break down. So example 5.6. The way that I'll have it on an exam is I will have a, you know, more than likely be four instructions, and I will say part A. Show me where the date, where the uh, where the uh, pipeline hazards are. Part B. How would this be done if we just inserted stalls? Part C. How would we do this with data forwarding? It turns out, once you start understanding it, that's actually a much simpler question than it sounds. So show the instances where data forwarding is required in the pipeline data path. So what ends up happening is you just understand how it's flowing through the system here. So where we have values, we have value 1 and 3, and are they're writing to 2, correct? And then the next instruction, I need the value 2 here in order to do the addition that goes to 12. Same thing, 6 and 2, 2 and 2, and then uh, 2, and then 100 get added to 15. So where are my ha hazards? So the first thing, um, this I'm, gonna, I'm not going to use this uh, 
diagram here because I think this can confuse students more than helps. Um, I would do fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back, <coughs> fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back, fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back, fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back, fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back. So the question becomes, where do I need specific register values? So I do in blue here. I calculate the value of 2 here, right, and put it on where I've drawn this dot up to execute because that's where my arithmetic logic unit is, right? So the first thing I do is where do I need, and then, I, I'm sorry, before I go, say the question, I will also have it here from data memory and right back there. So that's where 2 is going to be at any <coughs> given moment before it's written to the registers. So here, what's going to happen is I would need to forward it to this ALU because I need two in the next signal, right? Next, next clock cycle, I need two here, correct? So I have not written it back to the ALU, so I'm forwarding it from the memory to this ALU. See how it works? It's taking it from the data memory, and I would need to write it back there. So that's why we have the pipeline uh, hazard there. Now right back here, I have not, it's right, it's going back to the registers write than read, but it has the, the reason why this is the case is because even though it's being written to the register and put on the buffer, we still have th this value that's being put onto the ALU is being taken from that buffer and put on to the ALU, right? So it hasn't, it's gonna, we're still, we still are one clock cycle away before the write than read capability is next is it comes into play. So in this case, we would actually have that as, as a hazard as well. And the difference is now, if I didn't have write and read capability of MIPS, I would actually have to wait another cycle before I had to do more data forwarding, right? So in this case, but because I have write and read capability of RIPS, of write then read capability in MIPS, this last execution is not a hazard. Does that make sense? Any questions? Oh. <coughs> so what st students will typically do on an exam is they'll draw something out like this and then what they'll do on the exam is they'll go circle like that, right? See how it's the, this one, this, this execution there, this execution, this, but not this one there? See how that's not the case? Yeah, so that's sufficient for full credit. Again, I've included this diagram to help with understanding. I do not expect you to draw the register. I don't expect, I do not, don't waste your time doing that on an exam. Trust me, you have plenty of other drawing to do. All right, so here's a here's a better example of what okay, so 5.8 will be very similar to the question <coughs> you'll see on the exam. Consider the following MIPS code sequence: load word uh, is T2, 40 T5, add or I'm adding T2 and T8 and putting it into T5. Subtraction where I do T2 and T5 and uh, subtract T5 from T2 and put it into T3, and then I store the value in the register T3 and put it into 20, uh, the off, or 25, or T5 is the base pointer and 20 is my offset. So basically T5 is some array, and at first I get, if we were to write this uh, in code, basically this would be, let's say uh, T5 was array, what's the value from that I want the array here from 40? 
<coughs> 10, very good. And what about this value? Which one am I going to want? 5. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just saying i equals array of 10. Then I'm adding some value of t8. I'm subtracting, putting that in t5. And then i is, you know, subtract uh, t5. I'm putting that in t3. And then t3 is going to be array of 5 is going to be j or something like that. So some basic MIPS code. So the first part of the question is assuming no forwarding. Identify all pipeline hazards between pairs of instructions. So in this case, what's going to happen here is you have to kind of understand how everything's flowing through the data path. So you see how I've uh, written out everything here. Fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back. So I, in ideal pipe, it would take eight cycles. First, I have, I, I go all the way through here. I know the value is going to be available on T2 after memory, correct? Because it's a load word instruction. So it's going to be taken from data memory and put on that, on that buffer. So the first thing I would need to do is take T2, and these are both hazards. You see that? Uh, the solution, I've color-coded it to make it easier to read. Now let me zoom in on that so you all can see. So this is a hazard because I'm waiting for data memory. I would have to forward it here to the execution unit. And then same thing right back. I'd have to forward it to the ALU. So these are hazards. Likewise, in the addition, I'm calculating T2 and T8 and adding them and putting the result in T5, right? So I would also need T5 here and there because I have not don't have the value in the register yet. So those are both hazards. And then finally, and this is this here, and please feel free to ask me questions because this is probably the single most common student mistake on any exam in this course. What I'm about to talk to you about right here. T T3 is the result of T2 minus T5, right? The most common mistake students will make is they will not identify this as a hazard. And the reason why is because they don't truly understand what the store word instruction is actually doing. That's why I always say taking the value from T3 and then putting it where the base pointer is T5 with the offset of 20, right? So what's happening is I'm calculating this value of T3, and then I need that value to put it back into data memory. Right? So that is a hazard as well. Oh, what do you mean on the right uh, side? Like all the oh, uh, this is fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back. This is, I've set up an ideal pipe. <coughs> and what's actually going on here is that, uh, you mean this last, this one here? Yeah, okay, so uh, where the hazard begins is I calculate the value of T3 here, right? And then I'm actually getting the value from the registers to put on this buffer here. So I need to put that on the buffer so that way it goes to the data memory. So let me, uh, answer, I, I, uh, let me explain that again. So what's happening here is I have a value coming from T3 that we have not written back to the registers. And then what's happening is if we call from the, the registers, right? So it comes from, there's read data two, and it comes out, it goes around the ALU and goes to, eventually goes to the data memory, right? For the, for the right data. That value has been calculated here from the arithmetic logic unit and has not been written, written back to the registers that's waiting on the buffer at the next stage. So I have a value here and a value here where this is the old value and that's the new value, so we have a data hazard.
Any other questions? All right. So part B, now we have a data path where we have stalls but no forwarding. So how do we handle this? So we have to wait until the value is written in the register and we can put it on the buffer in this case. So what's happening here is that I have the value that's being written back and then can be put onto the uh, ALU in the next stage. Does that make sense? <coughs> so the trick is always figure out where it's going to come from, uh, can be written to the register and then can be put onto the buffer in the next stage. So this is why write and read is so important. If I'm writing to the registers, I can then take the value from that register and put it on the buffer. And then it can be waiting there to be used by the ALU in the next stage. So if you know there's a data hazard, you should insert uh, two stalls. But the way I figured it out when I was a student was I had fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back, correct? I would know intuitively that execution of the next instruction has to be the next cycle, right? And then it just becomes easy, and then it becomes decode uh, fetch, right? And then fetch should be here, so then I insert stall and stall. That's my little trick that I learned. It makes things a lot easier. So you see, that's why there's a, those are two stalls every time. So that's why, so I've resolved this data hazard by inserting stalls. And now I know that the value of T2 that's being executed in this in the ALU there is the correct value. So next, I'm calculating T5, right, for the addition. Well, guess what? Now my hazard is here. So I've resolved all the T2 hazards, but I've not yet resolved the T5 hazards. So again, I know that after write back, I can put the ALU on the next stage. So that requires insertion of two stalls. And then likewise, I'm taking two, T2 minus T5 and putting the results into T3, correct? So the result is I need T3 there. So I need to put this there. So that's why this, understanding what's going on here, is so important. Because if you're not inserting the stalls, then that's going to be wrong. And then you, in, in part three, uh, where we calculate an improvement in performance, that's going to be wrong as well. So it's how does the, how is the code being executed in the advanced digital system to provide high performance execution of compiled code? So in this case, once you count it out, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 cycles. Now this is still an improvement even if we didn't have it because we'd have to do fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back, fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back. So it'd still be, uh, it would be fifth, uh, it would be 20 instead of 14, right? So automatically we've achieved a, a speed up of, of uh, 10 over 7. Make sense? So now we're going to use data forwarding. Now, the key thing about Part C is assuming we have forwarding, insert stalls as needed. We, can, we cannot forward the value until it is physically in the data path. We cannot forward the value until it is physically available in the data path. So what does that mean? If it's available after calculation of the <coughs> ALU, we can just put it right back onto the ALU stage, right? However, in the case of load word, when is the value physically available in the data path? Not when has it been read to the register. When is it physically available? Yeah, it's going to be in, in between data memory and write back because we're ca cal <coughs> calculating the offset with the ALU, right? We know which address we want. So then it's going to put it from the data memory onto the buffer in between deep memory and write back. So at the write back stage, we're able to put it on the, uh, we can put it immediately on the on the uh, on the ALU, right? <coughs> so here's the difference. Is I'm sorry. Here's the difference. When here we have to wait until after the stage afterwards because we're writing back to the register and then putting it on the buffer to which the ALU is going to use at the next stage. 
In this case, it's available during the write back stage so we can forward it immediately. See the difference? We don't have to go through the register. It's being forwarded. But in this case, we still have to insert one stall. Because normally, the way it would work would be fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. And then we have fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back. However, we can't do, in, in this specific case, we have to do the execution at the same stage as write back because that's when the value from load word is physically available in the data memory, correct? So this becomes decode, fetch, <coughs> fetch normally here, so I have to insert one stall, memory, write back. So in this case, when we calculate T5 from the ALU, it's physically available for the next cycle, which we can then forward it back, correct? So that means we can forward it back the next cycle, decode, fetch. We don't need to insert a stall at all, right? Same thing with T3. This is a typo. This should say T3. This should say store word. Don't know why that's there. You get the idea. This should say store word. T3, 20, T5. So what's going on here is I've calculated T3. I have it in the uh, ALU. So what I can do is I can actually put it on the buffer so that way it can be sent to the data memory immediately. Instead of having to wait for it to write to the register and put it on there. So we do not need to insert a stall. So in this case, we have now reduced it from 20 cycles to 14 by using data forwarding to 9. I'm sorry, to 14 by inserting stalls to 9 by um, in, uh, doing data forwarding. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about it? Yes, Chaney. Uh, how do we uh, insert stalls? Okay. We, we will be... In a second. That's it. <laughs> to, to be determined in a moment. Yes? Yeah, so it comes physical. In the case of the load word, it becomes physical. Remember, we have the data memory and we're calculating the address and it's written out here. It becomes physically available there. In the case where it's an execution stage or it's an ALU, that's the worst ALU drawn ever, it becomes <laughs> physically available there. Once it's available and it's put on the buffer, then I can immediately send it back. In this case, once it's available on the buffer, once the clock happens, I can immediately put it back on the ALU. Any other questions other than the one for Chen Ye I'm about to answer? Okay, so to answer Chen Ye's question, how is data forwarding pipeline stalls achieved in the data path? So you recall this table, right? Where we calculated out all the values here. So now to answer Alex's question in more detail, what we're doing is all of these control signals are being sent to the execution stage, right? So register destination, ALU op 1, ALU op 0, ALU source. Memory access, so I got branch, memory to mem write, and then the write backstage is register write and memory to register. And the reason I want register write there is because I'm having the value from the ALU or data memory from load word and then writing in this fifth stage. So I want this register write control signal to go along with it so that way the value that I want written and the control signal for that specific instruction arrive at the register at the same time. So, it's physically done this way. As I alluded to earlier, it's being passed along buffer to buffer. So the stage cycles, what ends up happening is we insert it. This is the pipeline data path. We have the... Oh, Jesus. So then we have the control signals written here. We have write back and, and the execution, they all go here. You see how that works? Right, data memory got branch, controls this. We have mem write, mem read comes along. And then write back comes here. And then you can see the way this is drawn. This goes to reg write, and this one goes to memory to register. 
By the way, Sal, this is how they threw it up in my class and just said, learn it. My, my way is better. But what's that? No. You'll do single cycle. Though, um, here, here's, a, here's a better question. Uh, I had a friend who interviewed at Intel, and they, had him, they asked him to do the uh, MIPS data path. And they asked him, well, how would you design it to be pipelined? So, but you could figure that out, right? Now that you are aspiring engineers and you've taken this class, you know where to insert the buffers, right? You know where to insert the control signals. So you just put the buffers in between the stages and add a clock. And I they will also have to add some data forwarding, which we'll cover in a minute. I gotta add some, but how is this actually done? So we have this hazard detection unit where what I'm doing is I'm con doing these conditions. I'm measuring the buffers, the buffer times at each stage. So I have the exit the parent exit of the register RV that's coming out from so this is between execution and memory, right? And the value from execution decode and execute. So I've got my ex so I'm comparing RS and RT with RD. Now, why am I doing RD here? These are the values that are calculated by the arithmetic logic unit. And these are the values that are being put into the arithmetic logic unit. So your data hazard means that I have to make, if these are the same, meaning that uh, that that's the five bit control signal, I'm mean, sorry, the five bit value from the instruction, right? If they're the same, I want this value because that's the more up to date value. That makes sense? The data forwarding unit is a control unit that takes all these values in, controls them, and then forwards the values to the data path in this case. So here's what's actually done. These are then the values are from the, see how this is from the ALU, physically available, data memory, physically available, right? So again, I've answered your question twice, so now with the official drawing. So this actually comes back and goes to both multiplexers, right? Same thing comes from data, me data memory, goes to both multiplexers. So how do we actually do that? We use these control signals here, forward A00, instruction decode execute. The first ALU operand comes from the register file. One zero is execute memory from the first ALU operand. And forward A, if it's zero one, it's coming from data memory. See the difference? And then same thing for forward B. Those are just the two different inputs from the ALU, from, for the ALU. So we're deciding here what we want to put into the arithmetic logic unit. And this decision is being made with the, by the forwarding unit. I think that's the last TGO. Yep. So I'm going to, uh, I know you all can go on the video. I think this is the last TGO. So I just want to, this is the full pipeline data path. It's not a, it's not a topical guide objective, but I have drawn it out for you and included it on Blackboard so you can go through the, and see how it all works. <coughs> so basically, you, you know, you have your hazard detection unit. You've got your clocks going in between your buffers, right? And what's actually happening is, in the event I want to insert a stall, well, I actually use this hazard, and you see right here how I have this zero value right here? I have all the control signals, and if I decide I need to insert a stall, instead of doing the control signal, I just wait, and I put in all zeros. So I'm not going to read from memory. I'm not going to write to memory. AOU source is going to be zero, but it doesn't matter because I'm not going to do any operation. I'm not going to write to the registers. So all the it's the data path is actually just doing nothing. Yes, Hyphen. Um, what is that in the middle of uh, the read that um, the read data one and two? Oh, that's a good uh, that's a good question. Right. Comparator. So basically, it's just trying to do branch. <coughs> 
and everything else is pretty straightforward. So register destination, we do the calculation, it's coming along here, it's coming along here, and then it's going to come back, and then we use it to determine whether or not it's the right register. Uh, industry quote, when I interviewed it, okay, so that, uh, so that was Ransford. It had the single cycle and said, try to draw a pipeline, which you can break it up into pieces. Demonstrate that you're an engineer, come up with the idea off the top of your head, right? So when I showed you this, because you understand the little pieces, it wasn't really that intimidating, right? Yo, engineers, you got this. Um, this is stop at 520 because this is uh, interrupts and exceptions. So 520, we'll stop here. And uh, yep, that's it. See you Friday. See you Friday. Uh, do we come up with time? Let's just do 11. Yeah, because I have that NASA conference call. Is there any way you can upload both videos or services? Oh, you mean the problems? Okay. They should be. They're not up there? All right, I'll fix that. Thank you.